it includes relevant historical information, and that's usually collected either by, you know, the interview with a parent or um, report cards, previous test results, <coughs> relevant medical records. So that's all part of the assessment. The assessment is all this collecting of data, and whereas the testing is just one component. And it's also, especially if you're going off to college, uh, the history of accommodations used in the past is good information to have as well, whether they've had accommodations as a elementary or junior high or high school kid. So How often do you consider current to be? Well, usually, if, okay, I don't mean to dwell on colleges so much, but usually they want to see something in the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, let's say here's a situation where your student was going into a private school mm -hmm. and you wanted them to have accommodations, and if they want, they wanted to see testing that would maybe support would support that, they'd probably want to see something in the last three years. So usually that's what if it's like so they've had it done. Would you say then in another three years? Uh, How often? Usually every three years is when okay. an assessment is done. But usually in a private school, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, ask you to do that. Mm -hmm. But in a public school, in order to maintain special ed services, they have to do a three-year reassessment. And in a college, I think if you go into college with a, a recent assessment, I don't think they'll ask you to be reassessed again as a junior or a... Sure. It's, over the years, I've had it happen one or two times where a kid has had to come in as a junior and it was like, you know, strange, you know, but mm -hmm. usually they don't ask you to do okay. that. Okay. And I... I how many of you have seen actual test results before, where you've seen all the scores? And, yeah, so you, there's all kinds of scores on tests, and uh, you know, usually standard scores and percentiles are considered to be the best scores to use. And percentiles make the most sense. If someone says you're at the 50th percentile, that means, you know, compared to other people your age, you did better than half, half did better than you, so you're right in the middle of that bell-shaped <coughs> Percentiles make the most sense. And the tests that you use should be valid and reliable, and that means that they've been, you know, they've gone through statistical analysis and valid means they're measuring what they claim to measure. And reliable means if you gave this test to, to this kid on one day and you gave it to them a year later or six months later, the score would be very much the same. That's what reliability means. There's a, it's consistent. Um, now, again, this is part of this is from a college presentation, but the norm should be based on age, whether it's children or uh, high school students. That's usually what people want to see are age-based norms. Uh, I know it gets a little cloudy if someone's repeated, you know, repeated a grade, then it, the scores might be a little less meaningful. So you have to discuss that if someone's been held back. Um, but there should be a clear statement, you know, usually a, a, a good assessment has a clear statement of the, the learning disorder or the attention disorder in the report, and there should be evidence that the, there, that the impairment is substantially limiting the kids, um, limiting the students' uh, functioning. The, the learning disorder is having an impact on how well they can function in school. Okay. And also a good assessment should rule out alternative explanations. <clears throat> the recommendation should be tailored to the individual rather than just using a standard set of recommendations. And uh, develop a strong rationale as to why accommodations or other interventions may be needed in the school. Now keep in mind if a testing is done in a private setting like Groves or any other private practitioners, the schools don't have to do you know, what the private practitioner says. The public school doesn't have to, to follow that. Often they will just because it's easier. <laughs> they don't have to do their own testing. But uh, sometimes they disagree with the, the outcome of the results. So, um, so I think the, uh, um, you, have, you have to be clear about why you think accommodations and interventions are needed. Okay, and then you know, most of the tests that you use in an assessment are norm reference tests, which means that the student is compared to a large group of uh, other kids when they develop the test. 
and then a norm is an indication of what's the normal performance for that age. And you have to compare kids who are similar in their age and grade and socioeconomic status. And usually when they, when they create a test, they try to you know, randomly choose kids uh, across the nation. That's how they create a test and, and, have, and administer the same items to them until they get a norm where everyone a certain age does this response correctly to these items most frequently. That's how they determine, uh, that's how they create norm reference tests. And so you have to go through this, like I said, give it to a large group of children and then IQ tests and mini tests of achievement, that's how they're created. They just randomly choose parts of the population throughout the nation and administer these items, these test items, until they come up with a standard where everybody at the eight-year-old range answers these questions correctly. They don't answer these correctly. Nine-year-olds answer these correctly. And that's how you come up with scores, what's average and what isn't average. So, yeah, so when you, uh, okay, so most scores, I think I skipped one here. Okay, so when there's, you find that an intelligence approximate approximates what is called a normal distribution. So you've probably seen the bell-shaped curve before. And so that represents how most of the people in the United States perform on these measures. The hump is big in the middle, because that's, most people are average. So that's why you have a big hump in the middle. And then it goes out like this. And it's thin out here because not very many people are really low, and not many people are really extremely high. So that's why you have the bell-shaped curve. And so, uh, and yeah, the majority fall in the middle, and fewer scores are at the extremes. And so it applies to a wide range of behaviors, even personality traits, and it even applies to those uh, tests of behavioral and attention. And so those are all norm, re you know, norm referenced uh, questionnaires. So whenever people answer, whenever a teacher answers on there that this kid is inattentive and off task all the time and answers a bunch of other items and then you score it and you plot it on the graph where, where other eight-year-olds, there's a column for eight-year-olds, and if it's really high, that means that compared to most eight-year-olds, that, that student is really inattentive. So even a questionnaire is more referenced. And so where you're trying to find out from an assessment is where a child's performance is in a variety of areas compared to the, the norm. Okay? I think I got stuck, Jacob. Yeah? Does the validity of those questionnaires vary depending on the extent of experience that the teacher has with that age group? I think, yeah, I think it probably would. Yeah, and if a, certainly it would. The more experience and that person just knows what's appropriate behavior for an eight-year-old. Like if I, I, I am not a teacher, so I've tested lots of eight-year-olds, but if I went into a, and taught a third grade classroom, I would probably have to get used to it and to be, decide, well, that's kind of normal. Or, Whoa, these people are out of control. You know, so <laughs> you'd have to be really used to it and knowledgeable. So yeah, the, the way they respond, and most teachers are pretty, you know, most teachers are pretty savvy about uh, how they're rating the kids, and we often have them fill out just a narrative too, just to describe. And and a lot of them, the way they talk about kids, just seems like, yeah, they he's off task, but this this is no worse than any other eight year old. And so they make comments like that. And so yes, it would be more valid the more experienced you are. <coughs> um, thanks for fixing it, Jacob. So. The importance of scores, it's really, it, you know, it's really important, this concept of how you fall on that curve, because that many disorders are defined by the performance that falls outside of the normal range. So if you are really low on reading decoding and word recognition and reading fluency, that, that's important. That means something, you know, as far as, uh, as, far as how you compare to other kids. So. 
And it's important to, to look at the pattern of scores just to see which scores are in the normal range and which scores fall outside the normal range. And that's one thing I've learned over the years about IQs. I've given so many of them, and I don't even think, I don't even hardly think about a full scale IQ anymore. I don't even give it much thought, really, because I'm always looking at the pattern. And so if someone were given an IQ test, and there's many, have, have some of you seen a, a profile of an IQ test and the subtests and all the scores? Uh, there's many subtests. 